Hello, BookTube. I've got a little bit of mail for you today on a warm, mild Saturday here in Boston, completely different from the kind of weather the rest of you are getting pretty much everywhere else in the world, certainly everywhere else in the United States. Uh, I have a bit of mail here, a couple of books that are already open, one that's still in a package. There's more to come, but I'm facing an obstacle today that I t didn't in a million years anticipate. And I need to figure out a way around it, or if I want to go around it, I had a whole slate of uh, video ideas for today for talking to my imaginary booktube friends, but YouTube as a desktop app is no longer working for me. It hasn't been in over 24 hours. It, I guess you could say technically that it works, but it's a dial-up speed, so any single video takes 20 minutes to load. So I click on it, the whole screen is blank, after about 10 minutes, the blocks of filler information start to appear. The screen for the video is still blank. Then after 15 minutes, the video screen appears so I can see the first frame of whatever video I've clicked on. Uh, and then after 20 minutes, it starts to play. Then after a second, it stops for a full two minutes. Then it plays again for a few seconds, then it stops again for a minute. Then it plays again for a few seconds and then it stops for about 20 seconds and then only after that so we're talking a half an hour after i clicked on it will the video start to play just normally without interruption uh naturally i went on to twitter to look for w whether or not i was the only one experiencing this maybe i have an old router maybe i have uh, bad connections or whatever but no it turns out the whole world is experiencing this uh and that it uh, the foremost theory from the people online was that YouTube is cracking down on ad blocker by essentially if they detect ad blocker on your on your viewing experience they won't play the videos for you they'll play them so slow that you will remove ad blocker blocker in order to get them at normal speed I had ad blocker forever and ever and uh, then a whole bunch of video a whole bunch of platforms that I go to started noticing it and not want, saying you're not allowed to have this or you can't use this site. Uh, I won't go into a long diatribe about what that is, about what that is. To say the very least, that is illegal. <laughs> but I won't, I won't say anything else about it. YouTube was also one of those channels. This was a long time ago. This was the beginning of the summer. Saying, you know, we're not going to play this or we're going to play this tomorrow. Uh, if you have ad blocker, please remove ad blocker. Uh, but I also noticed at the same time that Adblocker, the app, was starting to spam me with all sorts of, hey, we're doing this, or hey, we're doing that, or whatever. So I would have got rid of Adblocker anyway. I, I, would have, I get rid of spam as soon as I can. As soon as I identify something as spam, I get rid of it. Uh, so instead, in the early spring or whatever, when I was getting rid of Adblocker, getting rid of Adblocker does not mean in any way that I want to watch the block of six unskippable ads that you put in front of your video in order to make a dime. Uh, that doesn't mean that I want to watch those, those, those videos. So I, uh, YouTube, of course, while they were making ad blocker impossible, making it possible to watch videos with ad blocker, they were also pushing to me their premium service where you, you pay more to them and it blocks all ads. So I removed ad blocker, I dropped it and I bought, I, I did an, an initial trial period for that, YouTube Premium, I think it's called, and thought no more about it. It was it was very little money, and so I, I just did it. Uh, and apparently that has not saved me. If, if the theories on Twitter are correct, that has not saved me. I do not have Adblocker. In fact, I have a, a service that, if anything, should protect me from slow service from YouTube. Uh, but if that theory is true, then it certainly hasn't saved me. Um, and this has presented me with a weird, I don't know if the rest of you are like this, it's certainly a Steve thing, a Steve obstacle, a Steve problem, certainly a Steve detail, which is that I don't in any way, I don't have any motivation whatsoever to contribute to a site that I can't see. <laughs> Does that make any sense? It's like, it's like, what's a good example? Okay, well, for 10 years, I wrote book reviews for a, a journal called The National in Abu Dhabi, on the other side of the world. And it was a print newspaper, it was it was out, I got pictures of it all the time from people, but I saw it on their website. I have never held a copy of The National in my hand. I've never seen, not in all this time, an actual book review on paper 
from me at the National. Imagine if the National existed and they paid their exorbitant rates for book reviews and they contacted me and I wanted to write book reviews for them, but there was no internet. 15 years ago, if that had that relationship had started off, I would might have done one book review, but I wouldn't have kept doing it. If I couldn't see in any way the venue that I was writing for, I would have stopped. And I'm feeling the same way about YouTube. Why on earth do I want to make videos that I can't watch <laughs> and be part of a platform where I can't watch any other videos by anybody? Uh, so I'll have to I'll have to figure out what that is. Uh, I know. I was, I was banding this subject around with a couple of people last night via email, and one of them, who does not know me well, that is the excuse, he does not know me well, wrote back with a kind of a blithe, Dude, well, it doesn't apply to, to mobile platforms, just watch it on your iPad or on your, on your, your cell phone. Um, no. <laughs> no, not only am I paying to watch videos without ads on YouTube, but also YouTube is an ad. YouTube is an app on my desktop. If I can't watch it, then YouTube being crappy is not going to say, well, I see you're being crappy. Because I really owe you oath and fealty, I will go and find you on some other device. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I'll watch YouTube on my on my laptop while I'm working. If And I can't. I haven't been able to do that. So And I can't right now. I checked right before this video. No video will load. No video will play. They do load. They load at dial-up speed. So I click on a video, and a half an hour later, I can watch it. I'm obviously not going to do that. So, so, so I'll make. The, I, I'm not going to make any other videos that I did today because I need to. I need to figure out what to do about this. Um, maybe, maybe that person who wrote to me is correct. Maybe just shift all YouTube viewing to an iPad, and thereby maybe film videos on the iPad as well. Just locate everything there. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, let's look at the... I've got three books to show you. One is from last year. One was a late arrival here. This is by Michelle Brown, and it is Bede and the Theory of Everything. The second Bede book, new Bede, but this is the Venerable Bede, a thousand years ago, a great author. This is the second Bede book uh, that's coming to my attention this year. This is uh, Reaction Books. They have a whole lineup of uh, medieval lives, and this is this is the best one that I've read by far. Uh, let's see here. The Venerable Bede, foremost scholar of the early Middle Ages and father of English history, achieved extraordinary feats during his lifetime, including calculating the first tide tables, playing a role in the creation of the of the Calefirth Bibles and the Lindisfarne Gospels, and writing the earliest extant Old English poetry as well as the earliest translation of a part of the Bible into English. He also composed the famous Ecclesiastical History of the English People uh, with its single dating system. Despite never leaving Northumbria, Bede also wrote a guide to the Holy Land. The author of this book, an authority on the period, describes new discoveries regarding Bede's handwriting, his research program, and his previously lost Old English translation of St. John's Gospel, dictated on his deathbed. <laughs> uh, uh, this was quite good, so I, uh, I strongly recommend it. Then uh, this next one is due in May. This is Alan Grostefan. Uh, it's a novel called The Banana Wars. Uh, let's see here, and it takes place in Colombia in 1990. A violent strike at plantations across the banana zone leads to crops in flames, managers murdered, and the local economy teetering on the brink. In retaliation, the banana producers finance right-wing paramilitaries to cleanse the zone of guerrillas and their supposed collaborators. Through the intertwined lives of four characters, a banana worker making a play for power in the guerrillas, a decadent Colombian banana planter who runs his business from the safety of Medellin, a widow in Uruba struggling to stay on the right side of the local paramilitaries, and an American banana executive wading ever deeper into troubled waters. This book charts the struggle to survive in impossible conditions in a place where no one is to be trusted and no false move, one false move can lead to death. Starkly drawn from the true history of Uruba, and this period of conflict, including the unseen roles of U.S. corporate interests, celebrated author Alan Grostefan's latest is an incandescent historical novel for fans of Jesmyn Ward, Roberto Bolano, and Fernando Melkor. Okay, I'm not fans of any of those. <laughs> and, and for very, very pronounced reasons that certainly seem to be indicated in this description. Of course, the description on the, on the jacket copy is not the book. But this author also earlier wrote a book called Bogota, 
was praised by a certain critic I know. Uh, I did not like it when I finally got around to reading it. And not only did I not like it, but I also thought I was supposed to like it. I thought that it was very much trying to sanctimoniously critic-proof itself. This sounds like the same thing. It sounds like any like the like this book is positioning itself just slightly so that any negative critique of the author's job writing fiction this is not a history of the banana wars that any critique of the author's job writing fiction is going to be or is set up to look like not sympathizing with any of the poor people involved here <laughs> that's uh, we shall see i don't remember much to write home about prose wise in bogota uh, but the, the, I'll give, we'll give this a clean slate in May, <laughs> and maybe I'll write you a letter about it <laughs> in May, since I don't know that I'll be making videos. Uh, then we'll do this last one. We'll do the one. We'll open this one package. This was on uh, the front porch at five this morning, so I, I know that it's not part of today's mail. Today's mail has not come. Uh, but making videos for a platform I can't watch feels like howling into the wind. It feels weird to do. Uh, I imagine some of the rest of you have this problem i i don't know i'm i'm i uh i'm reminded of the final days of my experience with television where not only was the technology on the stack on this pyramid over on a table on the other side of the room not only was the, the technology getting more and more forbiddingly complex so that it, it you didn't just get a machine and plug it in there had to be diodes and electrodes on the right color lines or you would, the bomb would go off or whatnot. You needed to call in an expert to do things with your TV. Not only was that happening on one end, but on the other end, hour-long network TV shows, you were getting 22 minutes of the show and all the rest of it was commercials. All of it. All the rest of it was commercials. The forces between those two things eventually led me to just we while well, i moved house i i moved the last time that i moved i left the tv the all the boxes the dvd player the, the vcr player i just left all of it but now no this is this whole experience the technology and the product are angling to drive me away so i'm gone <laughs> it's just not not important enough for me to stay uh i'm reminded of that by this uh, because the choice here is, it looks like, I, the person theorizing on Twitter could be wrong, but it looks like the choice is you will either have videos at dial-up speed, so one video every half hour, or you will watch 20 minutes, 25 minutes of unskippable ads on any video that you watch, even a 10-minute booktube video. I thought the way around that was to pay YouTube to remove the ads. I did that, as far as I know. I'll have to check my Surly Houseboy about the statements in the mail, but as far as I know, I'm still paying that. But if that's not going to work, if, if we remove that from the table, if my two options are either the videos will start in 20 minutes and stutter for the next 10 minutes, or you will watch all these ads with your eyeballs and generate ma massive mountains of money for YouTube, well, then I'll just dump the whole thing. I don't need it, so I'll just, I'll just dump the whole thing. Unfortunately... If I do that, well, I make videos. I'm just, it's not like TV. I wasn't making a show in you know Century City. I make YouTube videos. And I have no idea what to do uh, if I can't do that. I, if I can't see them, I'm not going to want to make them. I'm not, I don't watch my own videos, but I can't watch YouTube. If I can't watch BookTube, I'm not going to want to join BookTube, I don't think. Uh, maybe there's another platform. Uh, but anyway, let's, let's, uh, let's just look at what we have here before, before I figure things out. Oh, oh, great. All right. Oh, my. All right. This is like getting to me. This is out already. I will read this tonight. This is by Fiona Maddox, and it is Goodbye, Russia. Rachmaninoff in Exile. Uh, and this is the moving story of Rachmaninoff's years in exile and the, the composition of his last great work set against a cataclysmic background of two world wars and personal tragedy. In 1940... Sergei Rachmaninoff, living in exile in America, broke his creative silence and composed a swan song to his Russian homeland, the iconic symphonic dances. Uh, what happened in those final haunted years, and how did he come to write his farewell masterpiece? He left Petrograd, which is now St. Petersburg, in 1917 during the throes of the Russian Revolution. He was 44 years old, at the peak of his powers as a composer, conductor, and performer, 
moving in elite czarist circles, as well as running the family estate, his refuge, and solace. He was already he'd already written music which today has made him one of the most popular composers of all time, the second and third piano concertos, uh, and two symphonies. The story of his years in exile in America and Switzerland has only been told in passing. Reeling from the trauma of a life in upheaval, he wrote almost no music and quickly had to reinvent himself as a virtuoso pianist, building up untold wealth and meeting the stars, from Walt Disney to Charlie Chaplin to his Russian contemporary and polar opposites, Prokofiev and Stravinsky. Yet the melancholy of leaving his homeland never listed. Using a wide range of sources, including important newly translated texts, the author's immensely readable book conjures impressions of this enigmatic figure, his friends, and the world he encountered. It explores his life as an emigre artist and how he clung to an old Russia which no longer existed. That forging of past and present meets in his symphonic dances, uh, and his last composition, written on Long Island shortly before his death in Beverly Hills, surrounded by a close-knit circle of friends. This is a moving and prismatic look at Rachmaninoff in his iconic final work. Okay, so not uh, a biography of Rachmaninoff, not a thousand-page biography. Excuse me. Not a thousand-page biography, which Steve, of course, would like. This is instead what we, uh, we, we so somewhat dismissively refer to as a keyhole biography. Uh, one little incident, one year, a year, the year of Lear, or whatever. Uh, but I don't necessarily despise those things. This could be really good. Uh, Fiona Maddox sounds awful familiar to me. Have you done anything that I know? Uh, you did a biography of Hildegard of Bingen. The founder and editor of BBC Music Magazine and the chief arts feature writer for the London Evening Standard and the music critic at The Observer. I don't know that any of that is familiar, but uh, this, this is late getting to me. This finished copy is in your bookstores now, so I will, uh, I will get right to this. I'll read this tonight. I'll throw it on the pile. Uh, naturally, I'll do a bit of a, a bit of a recon, a, a reconnaissance flight about uh, Rachmaninoff. What other things have I? I know that I've read a lot about him. We'll see what other stuff I've read. What what maybe I have here that I can you know check this against and read read up on. But fascinating, absolutely fascinating. So there you go. We have goodbye Russia. We have the banana wars, and we have Bede and the theory of everything. Uh, so three books in the mail for a watery Sunday, watery only in the sense of watery light. It is the rain. There was rain last night, uh, but it came and went, uh, it's very neatly. It didn't start until well after dark and it, uh, it finished right around dawn. So I, the bean was never inconvenienced. Jeez. She is fussing around over here. She was never inconvenienced by her mortal enemy, the rain. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to finish this video and upload it to the void to nowhere so we'll see maybe this is just a glitch for youtube maybe they'll fix it themselves uh but uh anyway i'll still have the comments field and while i figure out what to do uh, but the other i was going to do four other videos today i'm not i'm not going to do them i'm not this this doesn't feel real anymore it feels like walking on a numb leg so i'll i'll just do this one and uh Maybe tomorrow the problem will have fixed itself. So maybe I'll see you then. Thank you, book two.